your dress for the no, um, <laughs> hello and welcome to the march 27 2024 conservation commission meeting the time is 704 um members are all present except laura um staff present are aaron jock dave zomek is not here tonight um okay so chair report um I'll just mention that I went to the Massachusetts Land Trust Coalition meeting, uh, I think that's what it's called, on Saturday, and there were some really great presentations that were very much geared towards land managing, managing organizations, including municipalities, um, especially with DCR outreach and like forest cutting plans and some things that were kind of relevant to our land management uh, subcommittee talks. So I got some um, literature and booklets and we'll have some reports for the next subcommittee meeting. Um, okay, director is not here. So on to minutes from 313. Is this just an approval of them? I move uh that we approve the minutes. my microphone off yes just waiting for a second oh i will second that all right alex on the motion jason on second um andre aye bruce aye jason aye alex aye all right motion is passed okay land management updates the osrp I saw that the deadline has been extended, but do you have updates on that one, Erin? I don't. Um, it's been extremely busy, and I know um, everybody is really busy, and I know they were trying to give it a little more time and um, putting out, extending it to additional um, groups and uh, like the schools, um, the colleges, et cetera. So we were trying to just get as much input as we could. Um, so I think that's why it was extended. Okay. All right, well, that's it for that. Um, I think we can move on to land use applications. Um, we're a little ahead of schedule, but why don't you just- Yeah, I see, yeah, um, I see Scott Jackson is here. Yeah, yeah, why don't we pull him in and do the, um, um, sorry, Plum Springs, Plum Springs first. So, commissioners, this is a reoccurring uh, land use application. Um, so we've had it ever since I've been on the commission. Um, hello, Scott. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just give us a brief uh, introduction to the course, uh, just because we see it every year, <laughs> let everybody know? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Scott Jackson. I'm an extension professor at UMass. And um, since the 1990s, I've been teaching a course on wetlands assessment and field techniques <clears throat> pretty much every other year uh, since about 1992. And um, over that period of time, I've searched and searched for wetlands that would be suitable for the course that are not too far from campus. And I found a real gem in South Amherst, uh, the Plum Springs conservation area, and I've been using it for a number of years for the course. Um, I have 26 students that are registered for the course. The lab, the field lab is divided into two sessions. Um, so there's one that's going to be 10 or 11 people and another that's like 15 to 17, depending on sometimes people switch. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be out there for 10, 10 times total. Uh, so five for each of the lab sessions. It begins in April, the first Friday in April, and then runs mostly Fridays and, and Mondays until um, early May. And the basically the only impact that we have, other than uh, trampling around through the through the woods and through the wetlands, is um, for the wetland delineation lab, we will dig some soil pits in order to examine the soil and then fill them back in when we're done. 
And for one other lab, we will put up flagging tape in order to delineate an assessment area, which we will then remove that same day as we uh, as we leave. Uh, otherwise, we're mostly there with clipboards and pencils, and uh, they're recording things on field data sheets in order to write up reports about things like wildlife habitat evaluation, wetland delineation, functional assessment, condition assessment, and things like that. Great. Thank you. Um, commissioners, any questions for Scott? No? Nope. Okay. Thanks for showing up to tell us about it. Um, all right, so do we just need a motion to approve this land use application, Erin? Do you have a yes, there's no there's no motion drafted, but it is okay. CLU 24-3. So just a motion to approve CLU 24-3. So moved. Second. Andre on the motion. Jason on the second. Yes. Andre. Aye. Bruce. Yes. Aye. Jason. Aye. Alex. Microphone's off, Alex. <laughs> aye. And I'm an aye. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Scott. Thank Have you fun. very much, Commissioners. Good night. 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 Okay. Um the next one is the Groff Park Trails for an informational hike. Do we have someone here for that? Um, I don't believe so, but if um, if somebody is here and I was unaware that they were attending, feel free to raise your hands. Um, I can give you kind of a quick snapshot of this. Um, <clears throat> so yeah. the, the Groff Park property is actually um, owned and managed by the Recreation Commission. And the land on which the Emily Dickinson Trail is located is actually Amherst College property. Um, however, the Conservation Department has an agreement with the Recreation Department and Amherst College to maintain the trail that goes from Groff Park to um, <laughs> the parking area for the um, bike path. So the the application was is coming to us strictly for the you know our jurisdiction of maintenance of the trail system it's not our not that we actually own the property um, and the purpose of this is a a partnership with the recreation commission and kestrel land trust um and they are um uh talking about sort of fish migration i know brian yellen is going to be um one of the the speakers and um talking about preservation of the river the rivers that feed um the fort river and um learning about migratory fish insects shellfish um and take a, a half mile walk along the emily dickinson trail open to all ages so it's like a program that the recreation department is offering so kind of a feel good thing lamprey right mm -hmm. go ahead lamprey, bruce yeah. bruce knows about this stretch um two quick points the fort river watershed association was got the grant to rehabilitate the trail and put up all those little co q code markers that tell the story of the river and it was through see with we're a fiscal um partner of crc so there's that. And then it will be, you should sign up because Brian knows a lot, but it's also going to be really entertaining and funny because he is wearing a boot because he ruptured his Achilles tendon. And so him doing this talk by hobbling along the trail will be very entertaining. So I encourage you to attend. A little sadistic, but okay. <laughs> I was interested in lamprey. <laughs> um, all right. What's what's the date again? April first, or I don't have it in front of me. Sorry, I had just closed my screen when you asked. Um, April fifth, from three to four thirty. And in case anyone is interested, this is um, CLU dash twenty four dash two. Are they going in the river? Well, I guess Brian won't be, but oh. okay. So just like pointing at things yeah. on the trail. Okay. No nets or I. No, he didn't say so. 
All right. All right, commissioners, any questions on this one? All right, looking for a motion to approve the use of Grob Park trails for informational hike with Kestrel Land Trust and Amherst Rec Department. So move. I will second. second. Oh. Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Okay. Um, all right. So next up, we have a policy discussion. So this is, um, I think it was last meeting, Alex requested that we uh, set aside some time for some sort of basic discussions about uh, the bylaw and the WPA policy. And uh, we have some time this meeting uh, to discuss that. So I thought we could set aside about 20 minutes, more or less, about this. Um, we didn't have anything to distribute. Alex has something, but he didn't have a chance to distribute it to the commissioners before the meeting. So I think he's, go I'm going to give him the floor. And I think this is going to be sort of an introduction to a review of a certain component of our bylaws. And um, I'll just let, I'll just let you talk, Alex. So why don't you take five? Okay. And introduce us Thank and you. alex if at some point you want to put up uh any information on the screen just feel free to share your screen yeah if aaron um aaron can can you share that aaron you're on mute okay i can do that but it would okay so I'm going to talk a little bit about the 20% threshold that we deal with all the time on applications. Um, that's sometimes we talk about <clears throat> mitigating the impacts of altering um, areas within the 100 foot buffer. And uh, there is an allowance in, uh, is the way it's referred to in the regs. So what I did was I brought up I wrote up a like a four page document that uh, three page document <clears throat> that cites or copies the pertinent parts of the regs. And if we could go to part two, the uh, lower pages, I'll just show them that. So what we're going to do is zip through this real quick and uh, we'll have a little bit of a discussion, but then you'll have the document sent out to you to look at. Uh, can you yeah, just go up to the top um, top part where it says Amherst Wetland Regs. Can I do that? Do you want Do you want to start at the beginning of the regulations, or do you want to? Um... No, just on my sheet at the top it says Amherst Reg Regulations. Um, is this Is this Alex's sheet? Okay, so okay. you're in actual bylaws, but Alex okay. had like a informational sheet okay i don't have that yeah i emailed it to you oh you did okay hold on a second i'm like having an issue here yeah Bear let's give aaron I, maybe let's I give aaron a minute and you can talk go ahead bruce um while aaron is looking for that it's on page 52 of the regulation well, I've got, if you can if i can share my screen i've got it up so i'm going to go back to zoom and find where share is share screen post is disabled participation screen sharing i just got it on the screen um but i can if you'd rather okay. i can switch it to you okay so we're going to look at the right hand side because uh, just to tell you that it's there no the, the next the, the next page Amber, Amber, aaron okay on the right i'm just going to show you that what i did was uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the left-hand side in a minute, but everything I talk about on the left-hand side is on the right-hand side plus another part of a page. What I did is I pulled from the regulations everything that I talk about on the left-hand side. So when you look at this at home, you don't necessarily have to go to the regs itself. I did it for you. And I you can see exactly where I pulled information from. <clears throat> so um, I'm not going to spend time on it. I'm just telling you it's there. 
And um, in between now and the next time we schedule a, call, a talk on this, you can look it over. So right now, I just want to switch to page one. So if you could just make a full page of page one, Aaron, that would be delightful. <clears throat> there you go. And um, I'm going to make it bigger on my screen. Okay. So purpose here is to just review the context of the 20% threshold and which is identified in the regulations. Um, courtesy of Aaron, you have a link there to that section. And then consider some, identify some considerations, sort of the context for this, and then invite discussion. So we'll have some of the, we'll, we'll go through the considerations now, have whatever discussion you want. And then in another meeting, we'll continue the discussion after you have familiarized yourself some more with this and given it some thought. So to begin with, if we go down to the bottom of this before I go down through the considerations, Aaron, if you just go flip down to questions, um, I'll just tell you what questions I posed and should there be clarification about how the 20% is calculated, particularly for long linear resources, uh, such as a stream or a wetland, and are the conditions for the commission approving alteration inside the 100 foot buffer well understood by applicants and consultants? And if not, how best to improve on that? And is the 20% threshold providing the protection that is intended? So um, we're not gonna come to any conclusions tonight. We're just gonna begin a dialogue and try and wrap our head around uh, the 20% and how it's presented in the regs, which Aaron wrote along with Michelle and some others. So they're very familiar with this. But, uh, you know, I am i wasn't around when they wrote this and uh, uh, the rest of us were not. So it's helpful to just refresh our memory. So anyways, there is 100, foot, uh, 100 feet from wetlands can be considered a no disturb area. And that's presented in the in the preamble, which has no teeth. It's just um, to kind of frame the area. Um, and the in it is allowed that the the commission may underscored allow alteration of up to twenty percent uh, within the fifty to one hundred foot buffer, not from the fifty to the wetland. And there's a provided, and I discussed that below, which we'll get to, that's in number nine. So it's not necessarily carte blanche. It's not an allowance. It's handed out freely on a regular basis or not supposed to be. So alteration is specifically identified to the exclusion of other activities, such as removing, filling, dredging, building upon, degrading or discharging into a stream. And it's interesting that when Aaron and, and others wrote this, they chose alteration, which, uh, and that's the only thing that is mentioned as being allowed. Number four, the 100 foot buffer can be, uh, in, may be insufficient to protect many of the important wetland characteristics and values. Um, that's stated in in the wetlands regs. It might be might be a part of the preamble. Um, negative effects may happen immediately over time, as a consequence of construction, and as a consequence of daily operation. And um, we're supposed to think about all of those. Alex, just to keep track on time, if we're going to go through all of these, um, because people can read it on their own time, but is there anything you want to call out specifically under considerations, or should we go to questions and possibly open it up for discussion? Okay, let me flip down to number nine. So the bottom line, uh, I thought we had 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah, but I also see that our first um, NOI is at 730, so we'll try and... Okay. Sort of keep to time. So the bottom yeah. line, the commission may allow the alteration of up to 20% within the 50 foot to 100 foot buffer provided 
it is convinced based on evidence it deems sufficient that the proposed alteration will not have significant adverse impact on the resource area and will not harm the resource area values protected by law. And that's something that provided is something that uh, uh, we could probably pay more attention to and like I'd like to have discussion about later. But so in practice, the commission has approved mitigation, we're all aware of that, for impacts within the 100 foot buffer. And if the commission continues that practice, the commission, I, this is me talking now, should uh, be assured that the mitigation, if it approves, will be in full effect for the life of the project. And I think that's something we should talk about. So that's all I have to say to introduce this. Brew, hands are up. I don't know who came up first. Andre. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll field that. Um, first, I just want to go to Aaron and just confirm with Aaron that everything has been presented you know, to spec. I mean, the only thing I would comment on is that we didn't write the regulations. We revised, we revisited and revised regulations in 2020, I think. So um, Aaron and me and Leroy were not the primary authors of this, but I just to clarify, but Aaron, everything is fine as, as presented. Okay. Then I'm going to go to Andre, whose hand was up first. Go ahead, Andre. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, just a simple, uh, question uh alex you were talking about um what is permitted you noted that uh what was uh written into the regulation is um the word alteration and um i suppose what that brings to mind is uh, us needing to make sure that we have a good definition of uh, alteration and it should be defined i would imagine at the very beginning of the of those regs. Um, I didn't look up in the definitions. Mm -hmm. But I, okay, so if you do, and it's typically at the at the beginning, um, after it talks about uh, um, where the authority is from it, but that would be one place to, uh, to kind of set your eyes or set our eyes um, to get that definition and, and have it um, have something that we, what we know an alteration is and if not then i think we may what was significant to me is that alteration is a is a series of is in a series of words and although i was happy to give credit to aaron and michelle and others for writing them uh, which they declined um, <laughs> um it's per it's interesting to me that it's those other things are left out purposely yeah yeah no, I, I I get it. Yep. So what is allowed is if it if uh, the conservation commission uh, determines to do so is the alteration, right? Yeah. Right. Well, as opposed to building, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's what we that's where we need to kind of focus, I suppose. Okay. I, I was also uh, on the uh, uh, not on the commission when we re revised these, but. Um, I won't take credit for writing them. <laughs> but yeah, we all revise them. Anyway. Can you guys see the definition of alter here? Did it switch over for you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. That's great. Okay, Jason. Or unless Bruce, you had your hand up. I see Very it down. Quickly, um, do we have any background information on how 20% came to be the number? I can address okay. that. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing because it's really hard for me to like communicate with you guys when I'm not like seeing your faces. So um, buffer zone was in the previous iteration of the regulations, in my opinion, buffer zone was not treated as a resource area. It was treated as a buffer zone. And as a result of that, um, my observation was that like back when these were the original version we started with, there was a 35 foot um, setback. And I felt like that was definitely not sufficient. And as a result of that, what we were seeing were people pushing right up to that 30 foot line and also altering everything outside of 35 feet. So putting parking lots, putting buildings, et cetera. And I just felt like that 
that um, level of impact to the wetland was was really, really, I was seeing significant issues with it. So that's why the buffer zone sort of, and it is under our bylaw as a resource area, a protected resource area. So I framed it out as such and defined it. And, you know, I, I did do research into many surrounding towns and not just surrounding towns as in Northampton, South Hadley, Sunderland, Belchertown, but also um, other towns I was familiar with in central and eastern Mass that had strong bylaws. And one thing I found, which was in actually the Northampton bylaw, and I really liked it, was so in addition to making the no disturb zone a 50 foot, I also liked the idea of limiting the amount of alteration that could take place between 50 and 100 feet. And Northampton had a really great um, uh, section of their bylaw that basically stated they only allowed alteration of 20% of the bylaw on a given property. And so that's where that came from. I really liked the concept of limiting the amount of alteration that we allowed outside of that um, 50 foot no disturb buffer. All right, so there you have it, 20%. Um, and I think in that discussion years ago, we talked about how that allowed some development to move forward when like, for example, in Northampton, it's pretty impacted and urban in a lot of ways. And so there's like a subjectivity always, but um, to allow some development to take place with the, you know, commissioner approval within the buffer. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, thank you. I was also going to bring up the definition uh, that Andre brought up and just ask, I went to ask Alex what his, I wasn't quite sure what that sentence that was on screen regarding alteration, what, could you just flesh that out a little bit more, Alex? Why was that which, a consideration which, and what was which, it you were willing which, to discuss? Uh, which sentence? That which, alteration means to the exclusion of the following. Yeah, so there's, there's, um, yeah, there it is. <clears throat> there's below that is a whole list of things that are not allowed filling, removing, dredging, building upon, degrading, discharging. And in the regs, when it was revised, they chose to use the word alter. And as which to me means it's none of the other words. It's alter does not mean removing, filling, dredging, building upon, so on and so forth. But it uh, does in our definition. Excuse me. Alter means without limitation the following actions when undertaken upon or affecting any of the areas subject to protection. Under the bylaw listed in section 1C1, removal, excavation, judging of soil sand. So all of these things under alter are allowed. Yeah. And and so I, that some, correctly? It's confusing, isn't it? Yeah. That uh, no, I think it means without limitation, these following actions are allowed at the discretion of the commission. Like this is alter, yeah. like you can build, um, you can build in the resource area, right? Or in the in the in whatever area we're saying is the resource area. You can drive piles or erect a building or a structure of any kind, but it has to meet these other criteria first, right? You can't alter more than 20% of of the resource area, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I frankly didn't go to the definition of alter. So my number three point uh, needs some modification. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right. I was just seeking clarification on that. No, uh, you're, you, you, I'll fix it. Andre? Um, yeah. Um, it, it does kind of get a little confusing when we're looking at the, uh, what, so, oh, okay. So the one who wrote um, alteration is specifically identified to the exclusion of other activities. That's me. Who wrote that? I no, did. Right? Okay. All right. Got I it. did. And uh, I understand. All right. what I should have done is gone to the definition mm -hmm. of uh, alteration. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I, 
I have to admit, I had a limited amount of time to get this done today, and uh, I didn't do that. So most of this stuff's around page 52, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't have time to, I just should have done it and didn't do it and will do it. So okay. I'm in error, and we'll just move on. It's not at the exclusion of okay. those. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, good discussion. Um, so maybe if there's any other questions, we should focus on the questions that Alex defined rather than maybe some other items that need a bit tweaking. I know Alex did this in a hurry because he had some other work he was doing. Okay, so all right, one through three. Maybe, commissioners, if you have time um, in the next two weeks, to, I assume Alex, you'll maybe provide this in an updated form. Um, yeah, I'll um, I'll make the correction that okay. Jason pointed out, and uh, sorry about that. But the point is to get this conversation going. Yeah, it's drawing uh, attention to the definitions, and that's really important. So, and also just focusing on these questions is sort of our homework for further discussion. Uh, go ahead, Bruce. Just so we should try hard to get the materials to Aaron in the same way the applicants do, uh, at least if we can, a week ahead of time so that we've done our work and then people can have time to read it before the meeting. Yeah, so we understand, I just talked with Alex very briefly about this because um, this is a fairly light agenda tonight. So we saw an opening to at least discuss it tonight probably next meeting we will not have an opportunity to do it but it's been posed and here it is and here's the introduction to it so everybody can mull it over for the next month and think about it um but yeah this probably won't be coming to us for another four weeks so in reality two at least two weeks in advance bruce good <laughs> all right um, okay, thank you, Alex, for that, and just you know, keeping us fresh on our regs. Um, so everybody, forward to the discussion. Sorry, I look forward to the discussion. Yeah, it's, it'll be. We could spend a whole two hours on this. Um, okay, so I think we can now move on to our first hearing. This is open already, right, Erin? Um. Yes. It, okay. Yes. Great. Okay, so there's still some more butter notification with this one, it looks yeah, like. Yeah, they just got their butters list like a day or two ago, so they didn't okay. have time to notify in time for this meeting. Um, and so they're they're working on that and they'll be ready for the 10th. Okay, so we're looking for a, a motion to continue on this one. So this I is, move. Go for it, just read the NOI. <laughs> I move to issue a continuation of public hearing for 214 Main Street, BEP number 089-0733 to uh, April 10th, 2024 at 7.55. Second. Bruce on the motion, Andre on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I and I realize so all and I am and I um I realize I, I didn't read the NOI so this is a notice of intent for Berkshire Design Group on behalf of Emily Dickinson Museum for the construction of a historical carriage house and associated site work in the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands at two fourteen Main Street Map fourteen B lot twenty six, if anybody's calling in. Okay, uh, next up I think we have Ward here. Are there any um. Any other representatives to pull in, Aaron? I'll let you do that. So this is notice of intent, uh, Wendell Wetland Services on behalf of Kevin and Mary O'Brien for the construction of a new 1,200 square foot single family home and associated site work within Riverfront area of Eastman Brook at 260 Leverett Road, map 3A, lot 50. This project is proposed as a Riverfront redevelopment project replacing an existing garage and chicken coop structure. So we're gonna give Aaron five minutes. Hi, Ward, welcome. Hi. Um, five minutes for Aaron, um, and then Ward, I'll give you your five, and then we'll hear from the public if there's any public comments, and then commissioner questions. All right, Aaron. Um, and I just, I see Kevin, but I don't see his last name. If that's um, Kevin, as in the owner of the property, and you wanna join us, yeah. uh, Kevin O'Brien, uh, I can bring you in too. Mm -hmm. 
Um, okay, so I'll promote you to panelist and I'll just give a quick intro. So um, this property, 260 Leverett Road, um, came to us um, when M Mr. O'Brien purchased the property. Um, there's a historic home on the site already, and um, he was looking to make it um, handicap accessible, but there are constraints with the construction of the historic home to to sort of bring it into accessibility standard. And so um, he was, from my understanding from speaking with the planning department, he was looking to basically um, build a new house on the site of the existing historic home. And the uh, historic commission and or planning department um, kind of uh, well, there was a, a demolition delay, so they were working with him to try to come up with a solution to save the historic home, and the solution was basically for him to construct the home he was looking to construct in a different area of the property, preserving the historic home and its existing footprint. And just for the um, sake of understanding, the historic home is outside of jurisdiction. This home is um, in the riverfront area, but it's between the um, 100 foot and 200 foot, so the outer riparian zone. And um, uh, they're also looking to redevelop the footprint of the existing, there's an existing pretty significant chicken coop structure that's already located on the location where he wishes to put the new construction. Um, based on all things considered, and even just looking at the overall size mm -hmm. of the property, I don't um, I don't have any concerns about, you know, replacing the footprint of the chicken coop with a with a new home. Um, we did discuss and I made recommendations in the field about establishing a permanent mitigation area in the existing wetland location, um, which borders the Eastman Brook and Ward um, took my comments into consideration and submitted a mitigation plan um, that basically it's a pretty significant planting plan and they would demarcate that area um, with boulders to be a permanent um, mitigation area on site that wouldn't be touched in perpetuity. So I feel like there's sort of a balancing of interests here, but overall I feel like it's, um, you know, we've worked together to try to come up with a, a, um, a worthwhile um, mitigation plan to compensate for the construction of the home. Uh, one point I will make, which I think is really important here is the entire site was not delineated with this um, uh, notice of intent. So only portions of the property were delineated. And so it's really important that when we issue the order of conditions that mm -hmm. um, that's noted on the record that only portions of the site where the flagging um, is located were um, were delineated, so. Thanks, Aaron. Ward, do you wanna give us a presentation here? Yeah, just, I don't know if you have a, uh screenshot of the, of the plan Aaron you can you can show um sure I don't know if you you guys are some of you are familiar with it I'm sure but there's a paved driveway as you look at the site to the west oh. of Leverett Road it's a paved driveway that goes in existing houses to the right chicken coop is to the right to the left is the perennial stream with a bordering vegetated wetland and a strip of um riverfront area that's outside of the wetland that's mainly golden rods and grasses. Um, yeah, you can see that. Oh, did you want me to pull up the mitigation plan or the- No, this is, this is fine. This okay. is fine for now. So you can see the driveway kind of in the middle there. Um, all the work is gonna take place, proposed work would take place away from the perennial stream on the other side of the existing paved driveway. Um, as Aaron said, most of the new house location will be within the, the footprint of a, of a chicken coop. Um, there will be a total of 2,604 square feet of new impact. And most of that's for a septic system and some lines that are gonna go underground. But we're proposing to mitigate that at a two to one ratio, but most of that is most of that area, although we're counting it as disturbance, is currently lawn and will go back to lawn. So it's not going to be a structure or anything like that. So we're proposing to do over 5,000 square feet of mitigation in the lower part of your plan. You see a proposed mitigation area. Um, 
will be a total of 55 shrubs are proposed to be planted. So that'll be evenly distributed between winterberry, holly, spice bush, silky dogwood, high bush blueberry, and high bush cranberry. And then if you can, I don't know if you can pan down, can't quite see it, but on the other side of this perennial stream, there's a line of evergreen trees kind of along the property line there that are dying. And so we're proposing to plant 10 trees there, uh, split between black willow and swamp white oak to eventually replace those evergreens when they die. And then the third thing is Aaron uh, recommended is we're proposing to put a row of boulders at um, 20 to 25 foot intervals along the edge of the mitigation area. So that will be um, a clear limit of work area. So there'll be no further mowing or any kind of intrusion outside of the existing lawn. So these are the, the trees that um, Ward is referencing. And this is um, a portion of the area, the wetland area. But you can see, like, um, to the right of where Bruce is in this photo, there's um, there are, like, some grasses on either side of the, of the stream. And so those are the areas where we had discussed um, doing some of the areas we'd right here uh, doing yeah. the um, plantings. Yeah. And in the back there, you can see that area on the other side of the brook is where um, that would be planted with trees. Yeah, the same in that picture. So, yeah, and all along here on the other side of the apple trees would be all uh, plantings. Right now, like I said, it's mostly golden rods in the in the non wetland, and then um, there's some cattail reed canary grass. We won't be planting shrubs in the cattail because that's that was like an old uh, farm pond that's filled in. But all of the grassy areas would be planted with with as I said, 55 shrubs. Thanks, Ward. Um, all right, I know Bruce is on the site visit, so I'd like to hear from you, Bruce, if I see Jason's hands up. Go ahead, Jason. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just have a question about the boulders. It said that they're going to be spaced roughly 20 to 25 feet apart, mm -hmm. and the purpose of those is to prevent mowing. Um, you know, 20 to 25 feet is easily enough space for a mower to get through. Are there any other potential um, deterrence that we can put up split well, rail fence, something like that to, to well, I demarcate. Think, I think if you, if you prefer, we can put um, some of those shrubs along that row too. That would be another thing. So that would be a deterrent to mowing the shrubs there. I think that's the plan was to make that, uh, to have that grow up to be more of a shrub area than a grassy area. Okay. And is this the, um, is it the homeowner that's doing the mowing or are they having the know, homeowner somebody they're hiring someone who homeowner. may come in and not know what the plan is? No, it's the homeowner. All so right. I, I think the intention of this is eventually when these shrubs get larger, the area will no longer be a meadow. It'll be a shrub area so that, you know, but the, the the idea of the boulders is so that it's clear where the edge of mowing is allowed and that nobody will, you know, the concern is in the future, somebody might, if he sells the property and it, you know. Yeah, that's my concern is that if the property gets sold or a third party comes in, a, a lawn service that doesn't know that they're not supposed to necessarily go on the Some, other side of the boulders. I mean, Kevin can correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of these areas before he purchased the property were brush hogged regularly. So that's why they don't have um, a shrub community. So if we go five or 10 years with these plantings and with the natural stuff that will come in, I think that area will all grow up and it won't be um, somewhere that anyone even think about mowing. I would prefer that's right, Ward. So I, I like that idea of interspersing the uh, some shrubs along that same line as the boulders are. Too. Okay, well, Kevin, I think is going to be the guy doing it, so um, he's <laughs> understood. Right. Understood, and and I think the shrubs within a year or two will create a pretty strong thicket that, like Ward said, nobody would even think of trying to mow through it. All right, Aaron, is that something that we would add to the conditions? Yeah, so um, I can 
um, add a condition to the existing drafted order of conditions that states that um, shrubs will be planted along the boundary of the mitigation area to create uh, like a shrub barrier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. between the boulders. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jason. Chris, do you want to um, comment anything? Very quickly, I when I was out there, it was pretty self-evident where the boundary was. <laughs> and yes, it is possible that someday, way off in the future, someone would bring a rush hog in, but they would do that, I think, knowing that they were going over a line that was not supposed to be gone over. And I believe it's our understanding that people who get orders of conditions are supposed to make sure that their contractors know what the orders are. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm sure Kevin will know him and him, him himself. I know what they are, but someday other contractors need to be informed about what this line means. And it all looks pretty straightforward to me. And the other thing is that Mr. O'Brien was very, um, we had good conversations about the plantings and, and what would really be the best um, mixture of things and about the dying pine trees and how to build that into the process. And I felt like he was being very forthcoming about working with uh, Aaron and Ward to um, be creative about what could be done there. So it, it, I would urge that we approve this. Thanks, I just Chris. add, like, if I could just add one follow up to Jason's comment, which is, this is, this is in the order of conditions. And so when they mm -hmm. get a, um, you know, this gets recorded on their deed, and we will have these as ongoing conditions. So when you get a final certificate of compliance, it lists the ongoing conditions from the order. So it's, it is tied to the overall property, even if the mm -hmm. property sells, that's still attached to it. So they should know that that, you know, management is required. Thanks, Aaron. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, just for uh, my own clarification, uh, you own all the lots. And um, just trying to turn my camera on. Whoops. You own all the lots, and on those lots is an historic house. So you own the historic house, correct? Yes, sir. And you don't choose to live in it? I do not. Um, and so what you choose to do is build another house, leaving the old one vacant? No, my intent is to uh, reduce by half the existing historic house. So the historic house, the original footprint will be preserved. And the addition that was tacked onto it sometime, some time ago, remove that and turn it into a ADU, like a guest cottage on the property. So it's, it's, it's a nice old farmhouse, but I can't have my parents stay here. It, it's just too dangerous for them to go up and down the stairs. Okay. So, but you don't intend to subdivide the lot? I do not. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I do appreciate the planting plan. Thank you for being thoughtful about that. Um, so if there's any further questions, we can move on to the motion and issuing an order of conditions. I, I move to close the public hearing and issue order of conditions for DEP number 089-0730 with boilerplate and special conditions under the Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations. I second that. Bruce on the motion. I have Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. So am I. Oh, sorry, Andre. I couldn't <laughs> see. Andre is an I. Yeah. Unanimous. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Thank you very Good much. Day. Thank you. Thanks Thanks for your time. Work. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin and Ward. Thank you. Okay. Wow. So that was it. Amazing. But <laughs> we have a lot of enforcements to talk about. And in, uh, in fact, um, I was out with Aaron on Friday for one of them, and we had a surprise other one. So, Bruce, go ahead. Um, well, what I was going to say got undercut a little bit with by what you just said. But I, there are times when I'm feeling pretty lonely out there on the side business. Oh. I'm just saying. <laughs> 
I've I've suggested my time frame, which does not correspond to Aaron's time frame. Okay, I it, I'm not I'll blame it on our children. Expressing my <laughs> my inner loneliness when okay. I'm there by myself. Well, where are you, Bruce? It was a fun Friday. Well, Friday. I can't do them all either, so I get. <laughs> Okay. So I think one one thing that I can suggest relative to the site visits is um, in a previous town that I worked for, we had similar scheduling issues and I would conduct my site visits during the workday. If members could join me for those, they would. However, frequently commissioners would meet up and it was kind of a fun thing for them to do on a Saturday morning, get a cup of coffee and go around and do site visits together. Now, they were mostly retired and had a lot of time um, and they, you know, would do the rounds and spend half the day doing site visits on a Saturday morning. I'm not suggesting you all want to do that, but I'm just saying it's, it is something that you could do set up regularly. And um, I don't necessarily have to be there. It would be tough for me to come with my kiddos, but um, you know, just putting that out there as a thought. Thanks, Aaron. I mean, I would be up for that. I guess I, I worry that my read of the land and the plans and what's going on is is far more limited when you're not there um, or anybody else is not there. So there, that's just my hindrance. Go ahead, Bruce. Now I'm going to turn the coin over and, and say it isn't going to, for the next three months, it's not going to be loneliness. Um, I've taken a half-time job and the schedule changes a lot. It's, it's I'm, I'm going to be a fish survey technician for the the Connecticut River Conservancy and I'm going to spend my time going down to South Hadley and Chicopee talking to fisher people about what they're catching and but cool. it, I will not be able to go to as many site visits so mm. I'm just there we are sounds like well, something I did about 30 years ago uh, well, I'm getting I'm bored with being retired you know, I, <laughs> that didn't take long Bruce <laughs> yeah. um, three months, so we'll see. Yeah, I'd like well, to seek that boredom. Yeah, seek that boredom. Well, we do appreciate the time that you have had on site because it's super valuable to us. Um, well, so I, and I like it. doing them. I'm just anyway. Enough said on that. Well, maybe we'll have a Saturday. You're gonna make me feel. Group. You're gonna make me feel like I never show up. No, it's everybody not true. Sh everybody, everybody shows, everybody shows, up. shows up. It's just. It's like. It seems to go in like one person will show up for this, another person shows up for that, which which is fine. And I think as long as we have really one commissioner who shows up who can speak to their experience of viewing the site, I think that's not uncommon. I mean, there was when I worked in Greenfield, no one showed up. Um, like no commissioners would show up. So, you know, it's it's nice to have commissioners making time to be there, but also you guys donate a lot of your time. So um it's really what you can do and and we can try to work around it and come up with solutions well i have to admit when i when i am able to go to site visits which is fairly often it was one of the questions i was asked when i was interviewed would i show up for site visits and it um um there's nothing like a site visit to understand the project and those, some of the best ones have been when there's been two or three of us to really take a ask questions from different perspectives. I'm thinking of the battery storage one, which was there were I think three of us there, and it was really good, you know, that way. So anyway, and we are, I mean, we are getting a new commissioner at the next meeting, so hopefully, having a full board, a full complement of board members, will get will get more folks on on site. So. Okay. Okay, well, I'm TBD. done as the uh, ranger, so I'll have some time. Oh, really? Okay. See you out there, Andre. Because yeah. <laughs> when I'm out there. Okay, let's move on so we can all have an early night. Um, enforcement orders. Aaron, take it away. Yeah, so um, as Michelle noted, for 11 Trillium, we had a our one-week benchmark site visit from the last meeting. They're already out removing fill um, at the 11 Trillium Way site. They already had erosion control blankets installed, um, new straw waddles installed. Um, we had a a good discussion um, 
with the landowner and with the contractor. And so I'm hopeful that um, the next site, the next time I get out to the site, which will be later this week, early next week, that um, there'll be quite a bit more stabilization measures installed between now and then. Um, does anybody have any questions on 11 trillion before I move on to the next one? I just want to make sure I'm not I, glazing. I have a question. Have you been out there since we were there? Because we were there like the, the day before the five inches of rain. Um, yeah. And I and they were about to do all the work. I'm just wondering what <laughs> if you've seen it. Yeah, I have not been out there this week, um, but I can try to get out there on Friday. Um, my schedule has been a little bananas, but um, but I can try to get out there Friday to take a look and see what's going on. Okay. There's a lot of imminent work to be done. And and I just have one comment on this, which is this was a circumstance where um, the violation was not because of work being done within our jurisdiction. It was work at, it was literally like at the line and outside of the line, but because there was so much earth moving and rain, all of the fill and the dirt was pouring into our jurisdiction. So this was a, just a case of where the it was like an infiltration made a jurisdictional and that that seemed to be difficult for the landowner to understand um that seemed to be a like a challenging point of him sort of accepting uh guidance from Aaron about what to do was that it was he said but I'm out of the buffer I'm out of the buffer I'm out of the 100 feet my my yeah anyway so this was just different and it, it was just a kind of a different framework for explanation but you look like go ahead Aaron. to piggyback on what michelle just said i think this is this site is a really important one for a variety of projects when we allow clear cutting in uplands adjacent to resource areas on slopes this is what happens right so we have to be very cautious and and we didn't allow clear cutting in this particular case. There was supposed to be a 50 foot buffer between the 100 foot buffer line and the house. The landowner cleared up to the 50 foot buffer. So they were claiming to be outside of our jurisdiction with the work, but they clear cut it, did earthwork, left it completely destabilized and it was on a slope and that's what washed down. So situations like those are the in my opinion, the most dangerous for wetlands when there's slopes involved and clear cutting um, and earthwork. Yeah, go ahead. When I, was, when I was out there, Aaron pointed out to him several different places on the site where the, the sediment was going down into the road and then into the catch basin, which then means that there's a different pathway to harming our jurisdictional interests. Yeah. So it was basically three sides. It was on a hilltop. And so into the road, into the catch basin, into somebody's driveway, and then into the river, like many, many cubic yards of just soil. And there are shovels and buckets down there where they just, that's stabilized. But yeah, I mean, it looked like, a, area. it just looked like they dumped dirt next to the river. It was, it was pretty dramatic. So this is the area they started removing the fill from. Right. And you can see it's just loose dirt, like silty, very movable. And this, this is the area that has not yet been. And you can see the rivulets basically eroding yeah. channels. This, yeah. This, these anyway, photos aren't as good because I didn't go down below. But yeah, you can see the, the rills and yes. gullies forming. That's sheet erosion. Yeah. So anyways, just for future projects, and um, if no one has any further comments on 11 trillion, um, I'll move on to the next one. So I'm not clear on what that's, are you giving us a status update or is there yes. an action? Nope, just a status update um, to let you know that we're monitoring it and we met with them and we'll be monitoring yep. it again before the next meeting. Yep. Um, so the next one is, um, <clears throat> the there's a lot on wildflower drive um it's lot 21d or sorry map 21d lot 16 it's a little difficult for me to d explain it's um it was a undeveloped house lot in amherst woods on wildflower drive 
um, it was it's the house lot immediately adjacent to an intermittent stream. The same intermittent stream, I will add, which is upstream 11 trillium. It flows downstream, comes under wildflower, and then this lot is immediately um, beside it. So this landowner contacted me in 2023, um, basically uh, stating that they wanted to build a house here. And I um, let them know you're in a buffer zone to this intermittent stream. Here's all of the, uh, here's a list of consultants. Uh, you have to have the site delineated, put together a site plan, come to us with a permit application. So fast forward to last week, I got um, an email from a town official who was out um, in that neighborhood and indicated to me that there was clear cutting going on um, up to the 50 foot buffer on this house lot. I reached out to the landowner. Um, the landowner said his friend who he didn't know their name or phone number um, was doing the tree cutting. Again, I was told these are like probably 80 foot high um, uh, pine trees. They were felling them with a chainsaw and ladders. Um, there was no safety equipment. It was extremely dangerous situation. Um, felling them onto the neighbor's property and there was a house immediately next door. Um, and this friend let him know that he didn't need a permit to cut his lot and he could just proceed with doing it and take care of it. So he sort of put it on his friend that his friend was responsible. Um, and also he said he had a hearing with the Zoning Board of Appeals and he sent me a, um, a legal notification, which was not for his lot, but from a neighboring lot where I had been in touch with the landowners because they did file with the Zoning Board and they did get in contact with me and they were not working within jurisdiction. So there was quite a bit of sort of stuff going on with that one um, and I'm very challenged by it. So I'm supposed to be meeting with the gentleman later this week. Um, very challenging situation, um, but I will pull up some photos so you can see what the lot looks like. I, I drove by there. It's pretty egregious. Yeah. If anybody wants to attend um, a meeting with me, uh, with the gentleman, I would welcome anybody who wants to participate. <laughs> Um, but also understand if folks can't. Um, but it it was very difficult for me to sort of get. Th so this is the this is the clearing, and basically the edge of the clearing that you're seeing in this vicinity is probably twenty to thirty feet from the wetland. And I will add, and there's a photo here that kind of does it better justice. Um, it looks down a slope. So yeah, so the clearing is right up to the edge of this slope. And again, you see this steep slope situation happening down to the stream. So this is what concerns me is work that's on a plateau over a steep slope going down to a resource area. These are where frequently we see um, issues. So they were given a cease and desist. I contacted the owner, gave them a cease and desist the day that I found out about the violation. The next day, Michelle and I, when we were out at 11 Trillium, went to work on the site. And you can see there were people working there still. So after be being given a cease and desist order, there was still work going on after they were told to stop. So we, I notified um, W.W. Clark from Shootsbury that there was a cease and desist and they needed to stop work immediately. I also contacted the friend um, who had given, I got a contact number from Clark um, for the friend who had done the tree cutting. I spoke to them and said, no more cutting, cease and desist. And I contacted the landowner and I issued an enforcement order um, and told them that they need to file a notice of intent application. And I believe I gave them, uh, I am, I think I gave them through, Sorry, I've got a lot of windows open. So while you're looking, Aaron, what exactly is the violation? I'm sorry, Jason's got his hand up. I put it in. That's all right, Alex. I was going to go down the same route. Uh, what what was in? I don't I don't recall seeing the enforcement order or the uh, notice of violation. I saw the cease and desist. But what it, what are we, what are our options? And you know, I I would just like to 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 discuss in further detail what our options are, 
and what happens you know what when, when you order a cease and desist and they do not cease and desist great question <clears throat> um well, I'm hopeful that they will, in fact, cease and desist at this point, um, since everybody has been contacted, but um, certainly continue to monitor the situation. And if any additional work is going out there, we've got photo documentation. Um, and yeah, Michelle and I had a conversation about this as well. Um, you know, if folks are blatantly not um, responding to enforcement orders, they're going to end up getting fines and the fines are going to be issued daily. So um, it's not the ideal because it's highly administratively um, impactful to do that, but we'll do what we have to do to make sure we get compliance. Um, so in this particular case, the site wasn't terribly, like the soils on the site weren't terribly disturbed. So I felt like it would be advantageous for us to require to set a date and say you need to file a notice of intent by X date, which I gave them till April 30th. Um, I know the landowner wants to sit down and meet with me. I know finances are probably going to be a, a concern. Um, and I get the feeling that the reason this was done kind of on the um, uh, without permitting was because of financial reasons. Um, sorry, Aaron. Sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I have... I, I am not personally, uh, I, who, who's the, is, is Courtney Rose the landowner? Correct. Courtney Rose works for NAI Plotkin. That is a commercial real estate service leader in Western Massachusetts. I would think that this person would know that you can't go and develop a lot without permits. Maybe you and should go to the CPA meeting. That <laughs> was a little like, like this is this to me is particularly egregious. Courtney is a construction manager. Knows, no, like I hate to say it this way. I don't want to sound, but like Courtney should know better. Yeah. You can't you can't go and start cutting trees and start developing a, a lot without permits. I am 100%, 150% in agreement with you. Um, I had a really difficult conversation with him um, where there was a lot of excuses being made. There was a lot of blaming other people. There was a lot of um, my environmental engineer said it was okay. And by the way, I would like to just point this out because just in case the gentleman does come, um, the consultant that was supposedly consulted, which I haven't heard from, did not see a plan with flagging, nothing. But the consultant is a consultant that I have worked with previously and has worked with this board previously. And the, it was a different um, cross-section of board members because it was, pri I think, prior to sort of us getting a turnover in board um, members. But there was a situation on Canton Ave. I, Andre and Michelle, you guys might remember this, where this particular consultant showed up and said that there was no alteration as a result of an enforcement matter on Canton Ave. We hired a, or worked with the landowner. I was around for Canton Ave. You, okay, you were around. That's right. Okay, thanks, Alex, for reminding me of that. We had a, a second um, wetland consultant go out and determined that the first wetland consultant had either lied to us or um, didn't know what they were talking about. And the commission at that point made sort of a decision that that particular consultant, if they came before the commission again, would there would be a peer review of their work because um, it was clear that either they were not competent to do the delineation or that they were not, they were, there was some kind of deception involved in the presentation that was given to the commission at the time. So that is the same consultant that was involved on this project. Um, so concerning to say the least um, for me, because it's challenge, challenge when somebody like that's giving guidance to an applicant. Um, All right, so just, um, just backing up a little bit, can you just articulate what the the violation is like, is it a mounted basal area? Is it within the, within the hundred foot? Just, just yeah. so everybody can the, hear that. 
the buffer zone on the lot was basically clear cut um, to the intermittent stream. So they didn't own all the way to the stream, but they clear cut up to the um, property boundary within the buffer on their lot. So, you know, presumably within 50 feet, um, it appeared to be within about 30 feet of the stream boundary, um, but the entire swath of buffer on the lot was cut. Right. The 100 foot buffer. The 100 Sorry. foot. Well, so the, the stream is off property, so it casts onto this property. Um, so like at its furthest point, it was probably like, I would say, you know, 50 to 75 feet swath was cleared um, within the buffer, but the entire buffer on the lot. And we do allow clearing of trees in the buffer, but only a certain basal area. And this was kind of a clear cut. Well, that... for for non-commercial purposes, without a forest cutting plan, an individual landowner can can remove trees as long as they're not removing over 50% of the basal area and they're using the wood for their own personal cordwood use. In this case, there was a contractor taking the wood off site. Okay. So I don't consider that to be for cordwood. Okay, thanks. Andre? I forgot my question. Okay, Jason. <laughs> um, Aaron, I just would like to clarify. You said they can cut, you know, it needs to be for their own use, but they have to have a, an NOI prior to doing that, right? They have to come before the commission prior to going out and doing all of that cutting if they're doing it in the resource area. Well, this this applicant should have had a notice of intent application for what they did. But, but a, an individual landowner, let's say they're going out and they, let's say let's say somebody owns like ten or fifteen acres behind their house, and periodically they go back and cut down a tree and chop it up for cordwood. That's completely allowed under the regulations. They don't need a permit, a permit from us yeah. to cut a single tree down. Um, but if they're removing over 50% of a basal area in a buffer zone or in a resource area, yes, they would. So that's where, you know, they, they could thin a little bit, cutting a tree here and there for cordwood use only. That's all that's allowed without a permit. Thanks. Andre? I remember my question. It's Go ahead, more Andre. Of, um, more of a comment and with a question. Aaron, you mentioned that um, the they clear cut all the way to the edge of their property uh, through or into the bu buffer zone. So I guess you know what that means is you know how much further would they have gone if their property went even further in toward the buffer zone? You know, would they have cut it all? Would they? You know, but so it's I'm just adding to the comment. Yeah. Who can know? But um, I do want to just bring up a point that I've been thinking about is um, because we're not done with our enforcements for the night. There's another one. Um, this is posing to the commission proactive measures to somehow prevent these things from happening. And I, I don't know if it's a landowner thing. It seems to be sort of on the contractor end where these missteps are occurring. And there's many, many contractors from out of the town from far enough away that maybe the, the regulations are significantly different. But if anybody has an idea about outreach or some kind of thing like that, um, just so we don't end up here, I'd I'd love to hear that at a different time or email or something like that. But it was a significant enough of a week that um, I've just been thinking about that. Um, anyway, are there any more questions about Wildflower? Because I think we have one more to get to. One more question. When are you going to have that meeting, Erin? Um, potentially Friday, but also maybe next week. It really depends on... Um, my meeting schedule and it's kind of bananas right now. Um, so wherever I can squeeze send, it in. Can you send, can you send something out uh, in a couple of days in advance? Absolutely. Thanks. Yep. Absolutely. And I, I, I might shoot for early next week just to see if commissioners are able to make it. I just want to make sure Bruce is there so we can be company. Sorry, Aaron, are you planning on having that meeting at the town hall? Probably. 
or Zoom. Okay. All right. Okay. So so what we do knew what we do need on this on this particular one is a um a motion to ratify the enforcement order that was issued to map 21D lot 16. So moved. Second. Andre on the motion, Alex on the second, Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Nam and I. Okay. Um, so there was one more incident, uh, that was reported to me. Um, there's a, a letter in your packets, um, but I'll pull up photos as well. Um, basically the report that I received was that there was, um, cutting and heavy equipment, um, on a landlocked parcel that is, um, on, uh, on Bay Road, but only accessible through the frontage of a, a secondary property owner. I contacted the property owner um, who had the landlocked land behind the property owner to request access to get out there and do a site visit, which was granted to me. The landowner was very um, uh, cooperative and had indicated that they, number one, hadn't done any work, hadn't given anybody approval to do any work, and weren't aware that any work was going on. So I went out and did an inspection and determined that um, there had been a, a path cleared behind the house that's on the frontage part of the lot. A path was cleared um, going back to a, uh, a confluence of um, streams in the, in the back and that an area had been clear cut um, on the bank of the stream and also um, in a BVW, um, not a huge area, but um, on the bank of a stream and definitely caused an impact. Also, the, uh, slash, the slash from the trees that had been cut were, were sort of dumped um, on the side of the opposite stream. And um, there was like sort of muddy ruts that were left um, where this vehicle had accessed into the back um, and a path, like a, a trail had essentially been cleared from this landowner's property into the back. So you can see here, it's very difficult to tell because of the sun angle, but basically a path had been cleared and vehicle tracks were coming back from the house that's on the frontage, coming back into the landlock section. This is some of the cut material that was um, just dumped on the side um, of the stream bank. Um, this is, again, it's hard to tell because of the shadows, but there's rutting here um, it, right through a wetland area. There's some better, sort of better shots of it. It's, it's hard to see, but they're, they are there. Um, and then these trees that had like naturally fallen um, on the land had been cut to make way for this trail coming back um, through this landowner's land who had no idea this was going on. Those are that those photos are a little better. You can see the rutting a little better there. And who's with on? you? Who's Come standing again. with who's with you? Um, a person who shall not be identified. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So is this just, is this theft? Come again? Are they stealing? The no, uh, no, it's, um, it's, they, so I'll, sh I'll keep flipping through and you can kind of see what's going on. So this, this area here, um, can you guys see my cursor? Yeah. It's an area of the stream. There's sort of a meander here and this area was clear cut, um, there was several beech trees here and shrubs. And so they cut it and it looked like they scarified it a little bit with a piece of equipment in preparation for something, not sure what, but um, as I flip through, you can see the cut stumps. Um, there was skunk cabbage popping up underneath this. So it was definitely a wetland. And then there was this little um, sitting area that had been created ah. back there. <laughs> so I don't know what the <laughs> landowner you know, the, the trespasser was, had in mind, but like little recreation area back there to sit by the river, put down a blanket. I don't, I don't know exactly what they had in mind back here, but they were doing it on somebody else's property without their permission. 
Um, so they were sent a letter basically told to cease and desist. This identifies the, um, so this is the frontage lot and then the landlocked parcel in the back and it sort of identifies there was a path cut and then this area cleared. Um, so okay. I, I sent a letter telling them to cease and desist. The landowner um, who, who owns the property that was damaged is also gonna be in contact with them. So that's kind of where things stand right now. Thanks, Aaron. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, Aaron, do you happen to know what the laws are with regard to landlocked property and access? Um, in some areas, some states, you you can't have a, uh, well, for some purposes, you cannot have a landlocked lot. Um, the selectman, for example, can provide an easement for temporary reasons, logging. What, do you know what the, what the rules are? Yeah, so in this case, the parcel in question was actually like historically owned um, and and connects to acreage in the uh, to the north that is also owned by the same landowner. So this landowner has alternative, the landowner has alternative access to get to the parcel. The challenge is, and actually maybe I can pull back up that last slide. I don't know if it shows up on here or not, but there are two streams which um, come together um they there's a confluence of these two streams um yeah well, let me just this will kind of shed some light on it um so you can kind of see like there's a stream that comes in from this side and then there's a stream that comes in from this side so it's like this little peninsula between the two streams so while the landowner themselves can can gain access there, there's no way to drive across this stream or drive across this stream so i think whoever did this was thinking no one was going to find out about it because no one could physically get back there. Um, but uh, are I, we suggesting any sort of remediation for this? Or are we just starting with a enforcement order because damage has been done right next to a stream? So what's the recourse? Yeah. So I didn't issue an enforcement order. Um, I I communicated with the landowner. Um, it's actually the properties owned by a family, um, which are um for uh children of the former owner who are all out of town um and they they i spoke to them about you know how what their wishes are it's their land it was trespassed on and damaged they expressed to me that they did not want the people who did this to be on their property they don't want them coming back. They don't want them coming in there to try to do something. They're afraid they're going to make things worse and, you know, give more license for them to kind of take ownership of the land. Um, so they basically just asked that we tell them to cease and desist and sort of let the land naturally rebound. That was the request of the landowner who had the the act. I will say, like, in terms of violations, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's not a great situation to clear cut a wetland like that um, on a stream bank and leave it. Um, but I do think that, you know, later this spring, summer, we're going to start to see shoots popping up and it'll probably bounce back relatively quickly. Um, I'm just telling you what I know, but if you feel strongly in another direction, we can um, take other action. But it was not an enforcement order issued to the landowner. It was just a cease and desist issued to the neighbor that we believe had committed the violation but don't know so alleged right alleged jason that was my question was this is something of a mystery of who you know who gets who gets the order of enforcement who gets the cease and desist order because we don't really know right who did the the, the violation right well there yeah. There is some witness testimony which would suggest uh, that it was, in fact, the folks on the frontage, but um, just leave it at yeah. that. So yeah. there are people that are that have visibility to this and can see what's happening. And so if there's continued activity, then presumably some further like trespass action enforcement might take place. Okay. I mean, I'm just worried that we don't see what's going on back there and who knows what will happen next, but um, I'm glad people have their eyes out. Me too. Okay, um, so you're just giving us a an FYI on that one, essentially. 
Yes, and I'll keep you posted. The um, the landowner was going to also contact the owners and have a conversation with them. So I'll it'll be an ongoing dialogue, and I'll keep you okay. posted. Thanks. Okay. Um, unless there's any more questions, it looks like we have a request for a minor administrative change for MS Emerson Court. Yeah, and this one is not, I don't even think, honestly, you guys need to approve this. It's more of just an FYI. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I think it was Jason who was out on Emerson Court with me. Um, so there was a couple headwalls for the discharge points on the stormwater systems. Um, one of them was a, uh, a headwall had collapsed um, into the stream and they had priced out basically repairing, replacing the headwall. Um, and it was extremely expensive to replace. So they asked to replace it with a, um, oh, sorry, I'm, um, with a, a flared end. So um, a pipe that has sort of a um, level spreader on the, on the bottom of it, which I have no problem with that substitution. Um, Bucky sent me the specs for it. Um, and I think it will be just fine, but I wanted to just make you aware that there was that minor change to the permit so that it wasn't like I was just a, approving it on the side um, in case anybody has any issues with it. I'm good with that. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, do we need to discuss monitoring reports or should I go to public comment? And that's a cue for the public comment room to raise your hands, please, if you have anything to say today. Okay, I'll give it five. So I guess we're getting more rain on Thursday. Did hear that? <laughs> Is it Sounds a significant like amount? Right now. Is yeah. it? At least it's a little more thawed than the flooding condition that I had on Saturday. <laughs> Not good. No. Did anybody else have basement flooding or? My, not my basement, just like I felt a lot. It was like a river was coming by my house and we were bailing with buckets to keep it out of the house. It was crazy. Unprecedented, um, like frozen ground, four inches of rain, called Amherst Fire Department. And uh, we're going to be doing some draining work tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> A.M. Wow. Okay, so, I don't see any. Sorry. So, um, speaking about flooding, the Fort River has been flooding down by uh, Hickory Ridge. And um, like Kopinski wrote a letter to uh, a whole lot of people, including Dave. And I think Aaron got a copy. I'd have to check. But he specifically asked if he would, if Dave would. Uh, send the letter out to the commission. I haven't seen it. I've seen the letter, but I didn't haven't seen it coming from Dave. And there are two other letters that Mike Lipinski has sent out since I think October, and none of those have been sent to the commission. And I'm wondering why. Um. So I'm copied on those. Those were those were actually addressed to Dave. Am I incorrect on that? Uh, there's three of them. One went to Lynn Griesmer, president of the council, and one just went. Um, I don't know that I don't have the date in front of me, but I know when I read it, I, uh, it's all about flooding at Hickory Ridge. And uh, on the bottom, he asked that it be sent out to the commission. And I even maybe Dave hasn't had time to do that, but Dave hasn't sent out any of the previous letters either. And I'm wondering why. So I did include the Lynn Griesmer email in a packet. Of, yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah, um, but but I confess that I did not forward the email, the latest email from Mike Lipinski. And there were previous, there have been many emails from Mike um, about the flooding, sort of updating us on the you know flooding because he monitors out there quite a bit. Um, and I apologize if I've been um, negligent in forwarding those along. They were, I believe most of them were addressed to Dave and then Dave responded accordingly. So I didn't 
necessarily know if it was appropriate for me to forward them on or not, but um, since you've specifically requested, I will absolutely um, forward that along to you guys um, so that you can see it. And um, if anyone's interested in the previous correspondence, I can track those down and put them in the packet too, so you can see sort of the historic um, uh, Interesting dialogue. Dave's response too, but it, uh, one of the things that Dave pointed out, I mean, uh, Mike pointed out is uh, progress. We haven't been making much progress on alternative access for fire trucks. And, um, um, you know, he pointed that out, I think in October. So don't yeah. mark me on, I might be off by a month, but a long time ago. Yeah. And so we've had, we've had discussions about Hickory Ridge, but, uh, we don't get very many updates about increasing access. Yeah, so I can give you um, an access, uh, an update based on what I know on access. Um, myself, Dave, and um, Jeff Olmstead and Chris Bascom, and there was another gentleman from the fire department, and I'm blanking on his name, but we met with the uh, um, managers, uh, the property managers for Mill Valley Apartments, um, I believe it was last week. And we had a discussion with them and we walked the site. Um, so there, there is stuff going on behind the scenes um, and we're working with them to try to come up with an emergency access, but it's, you know, there's a lot of parties involved in the discussion and um, it requires access through private landowner um, access points. So we're trying to be respectful of making sure that they're communicated with before we sort of announce it publicly. Um, and also that they are okay with what's being proposed. So, but once we get to that point, we'll we'll definitely be giving you more updates on where things stand and what the plan is moving forward. Yeah, I'd appreciate it if Dave has news about Hickory Ridge, if he would include it in his director's report in the beginning of the meeting. Okay. I, I think, excuse me, I think Mike commented in that letter that um, Pure Sky's planning to use the same batteries. So um, um, I think I think Mike is in communication with those folks pretty, I don't know how he gets his information, but I think he communicates directly with them and I, I think they communicate with him. But so access is gonna be, it's pretty important if they're gonna come back to us sometime soon with the fire department's okay um because access will be a stumbling block so okay it sounds like a complicated kind of right away easement situation which is yeah. time okay thanks alex for bringing that up um all right i don't see any public hands so i think we're good to go and he would have been like to Adjourn Before we go, I have an action item to fix the error in my write-up about the 20% um, threshold. I will do that promptly, probably not tonight, but I'll do it tomorrow morning. And should I send that out to the entire board, send it to Aaron for her to distribute? What do you want? Um, my suggestion is that you send it to Erin and then she can distribute it. And maybe Erin, you could just give it a very cursory look just to make sure there's nothing. Um, I don't know. You could catch something like that, perhaps. Um, but then send it out to us, not necessarily with packets, but just, you know, mm -hmm. as it comes. So we have plenty of time to look at it. Okay. Thank you. All yeah. right. Thanks, Alex. I'd appreciate it if you'd send it out directly instead of burying it in a packet. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we've got homework. And uh, I move that we adjourn. Second. Alex on the motion, Andre on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye, and then we're closing at 8.38. And I'm an aye. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, Good night everybody. Bye.